Let us while ago. His name is Jonathan Justice. And Steve Mowry told me about him before. And um, I did some checking on him, and he is a world-renowned chef. And he spent some time in Europe, too, I guess. And I uh, was a chef over there and came back to his uh, farm that his family has lived on uh, for generations. And he likes uh, cooking local foods. And so me and Steve Mallory were talking about this. And uh, uh, so I sent him up some nuts. I guess that was probably October, November. And so what he's been doing, he's actually cooking different recipes with the nuts. And uh, so I'm going to turn this over to him. And uh, hopefully it's enough time for you. Uh, with 20 minutes work for you, is that going to be about right? Okay. And so we're very honored to have him show up. And he told me, and correct me if I'm wrong, he's only missed like maybe a handful of times in uh, 20 or 30 years in the restaurant business on a Friday. So we're very, very honored to have him come up here. So thank you very much. And I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. You're right, it is very rare that I miss uh, a dinner service at the restaurant. Um, yeah, we can hear you. I want to talk about a few things. Uh, one was first how I got interested in wild and native foods. And it probably started when I was very young when my father and I go out morel hunting in the spring. And, uh, and that led to an, an incident that happened to me the first time I was living in France. My wife and I we were taking a bicycle trip through Provence, and uh, we had just moved to the country, and we decided to take a 10-day bike trip around and see what things looked like. And uh, we were coming into this small town in the evening, and this elderly woman with a basket popped out of the woods right next to us. It kind of scared me. And uh, she had this big basket, and we camped out that night, and we went into town the next morning, and when we got to the local farmer's market, she was there with the wares that she had pulled out of the woods the night before, and there were greens, and there were berries, and mushrooms, and it was, it was an entire assortment of things that she had. And it really, I have, wasn't cooking professionally yet. Actually, I was a, a painter. I was gallery, gallery represented in San Francisco for 10 years, and I was in the south of France painting at the time. And how I got into cooking is while we were there, I was afraid we were going to run out of money. And I took a job um, working under the table in a kitchen, and a couple of things happened to me there. One was that um, at that time in San Francisco, I don't know if you guys know what this job is, but I was a bicycle messenger, and I was for 13 years. And before that, I repossessed cars for two years to pay off student loans from art school. And, and these are all disciplines of solitary confinement. And when I got into that kitchen the first time, it was a social and collaborative atmosphere that I had never been exposed to. And I realized instantly that I don't like myself enough to spend that much time alone. And, I, and uh, the second thing that happened, though, was that I also realized that as a cook, if I wanted to, I didn't have to be a cover artist. I could write my own music, so to speak. I could make my own compositions. And that intrigued me immensely. And I started thinking about what, what that entailed. And I started thinking about from painting. There's a, in a classic color wheel. There's red, yellow, uh, red, yellow. Uh, blue, black, and white, there's five elements. And in flavors, there are five elements. There's salt, sweet, sour, bitter, and umami. Umami is savory. And, and there are saturations, and there's, and there's context. So you think about saturation of red or yellow is pretty obvious, and dilution is, it should be pretty obvious. Saturation, say, of acid, you squeeze a lemon in your mouth. Dilution is a few drops in, in a glass of water. And context, if you take blue, and you put it next to green, or actually let me go the other way. You take green, you put it next to blue, and the green's perceived as warm, and the blue is perceived as a cool color. But if you put that green next to yellow, orange, or red, then now the green is a cool color. If you take a sauteed onion, and you put a caramelized onion next to it, the caramelized onion's the warm flavor, the sauteed onion's the cool flavor. If you take that sauteed onion, you put it next to a raw sweet onion, and now that sauteed onion is the warm flavor. You take that sweet onion, put it next to a green onion, the green onion becomes cool. You put the green onion next to, say, a kiwi, and you put a kiwi next to a cucumber, or a cucumber next to pine needle. How you perceive warms and cools, how you perceive flavors, are contextual. I learned very young. My family had the, the drugstore where we are was in my family for 92 years, and the property where the building is has been in my family uh, in April 175 years. And when I was very young in the soda fountain, I got a, a 25 cent a week allowance, and and that. 25 cents would get me a nickel, give me a small Coke, 
I would give me a candy bar, I'd give me a small bag of Guy's potato chips, or local potato chips up here in Kansas City. And I remember one time I, I spent a dime, and in that dime I got a Coke and I got a Milky Way. And I remember I had a sip of that Coke, and I was probably eight years old, and I was like, oh, yeah, that's good. And then I had a bite off that candy bar, and I was like, oh, that's good, too. And then I went back to the Coke, and I was like, oh, my God, it was awful. Next to the, next to the sweetness of, of that Milky Way, the Coke just couldn't stand up to it. And so that's how I, the early formulations of me started to think about food. I want to go back to then wild foods. So I got back to the States and went back to San Francisco, and... I started cooking more and more, and by 2004, I quit painting and was cooking full time. I uh, became an executive chef in San Francisco, then we moved to Paris, and uh, I became the, uh, what's called the chef de cuisine, or second in command, and uh, at a very well known restaurant called uh, Restaurant Pure. That was uh, the beginning of a starting of a movement that's very big called the Bistronomy Movement in Paris. And then I was offered a job as an executive chef in the south of France on the Mediterranean. And uh, I was there for the next two years. When we came back to the States, we stopped by Smithville, where I grew up and visiting family. And we, were, we were planning on moving to Montreal. Mm -hmm. And the building that I had grown up in, basically not my house, which was the drugstore, had just become vacated. And we started thinking about the possibilities of, of maybe putting a restaurant there. I started looking at agricultural infrastructure because we are a very serious farm to table restaurant. And I knew that I wanted to do, if we wanted to do this, I didn't want to do food that was about France. I didn't want to do food that was about California or Italy or Spain. I wanted to do food that had a statement about there, which is somewhat here. I mean, it's, uh, uh, I'm trying to do food, I call it country food on steroids, but it has to say to me when I'm developing dishes, does this say something culturally and geographically about where we are? So things like Parmesan cheese, truffles, balsamic vinegar, I don't use those. Uh, we culture all of our own vinegars, we bake all of our own breads. Some things I really love and we've found um, uh, substitutes for, like capers. I really like capers, but uh, we've been pickling. I, I, I've tried to pickle a hundred different things out there, trying to find a substitute for capers. And the closest I've gotten to, and they're not native, but the little daylily flower buds when they first come out, uh, we pick those and pickle them and they're pretty delicious. But um, we have three properties that are dedicated to the restaurant that we're growing food on. And uh, the restaurant has, at its core, we're using whole animals. And so other than steer, which is there's just way too much grind on it for me to use, I buy the whole animal. We use everything on the animal. We do all of our own meat curing, all of our own sausage making. My menu freaks a lot of people out. Um, when you see face meat and trotters and tails and tongues and blood sausage, I take great pride in making things with these awful or variety meats that people have either had before and didn't like, and often maybe it was because it wasn't in the hands of someone who was as OCD as I am. Uh, I, I spend an, an immense amount of time, my, my flavor palette is from here, and like things like something as simple as chicken livers. I don't like chicken livers, but I uh, spent a long time developing a technique to change the flavor and the, and the texture. I don't like the texture of chicken livers in particular. And so I put them on changes of milk over and over again, and then we put them on a cure, and that leaches some of the iron and iodine out, and then it tightens the grain up, and then we wrap them in our house cured smoked bacon, and we grill them until they're really crispy on the outside, and I can eat those all day long. And uh, I have uh, pork sweetbreads. I spent two years developing a technique to uh, make pork sweetbreads not just palatable, where people would say, well, I have no idea these can taste like this, but stomach and kidneys and all of those things. So the, that's one aspect of what we do. The other aspect is what we do. It's very, very seasonal in things that will grow here. They have to, I say here, I mean the Kansas City area. They have to either have an historical context or something that we can grow ourselves. So I don't use avocados. When I was a kid, there were no avocados in the store. There were no artichokes. There was no passion fruit. There was no pawpaw, or excuse me, lots of pawpaws. Not in the store, but uh, uh, there was no papayas. Or, uh, you know, pineapples and bananas were around, but I, I still really don't use them because they're kind of tropical and they don't say a lot about the Midwest. But I do use pawpaws. I use uh, wild persimmons, the Diaspora virginiana. Um, and I do a lot of wild foods. One of our properties is dedicated to taking wild foods and bringing them into modern cultivars. And that's the property that's around our house. It's an acre and a half dedicated to this. And, and it's the easiest property to manage. And that's why it's at our house, because I work at the restaurant an 80-hour week. But we've done things like uh, penny crust, which is kind of bitter. 
and actually sometimes really bitter. When you go out in the woods and you find a genetic anomaly, and I found, oh, this, this one's nutty. So we gathered the seed from that plant, and we planted rows from that plant, and we got bitter, 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 nutty, bitter, bitter, nutty, bitter, bitter, <laughs> nutty. And then we eradicated all the bitter, we took the nutty plant again, and we did those and planted those out again. And then we got bitter, 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 nutty, bitter, bitter, nutty, nutty, bitter. And after about six, seven generations, we've gotten it down to nutty, 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 bitter, nutty, 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 bitter. <laughs> but the thing is that because they're wild, we'll never completely eradicate because of cross-pollination. We'll never get all the bitter. There'll be some plants that are going to be that way. Um, but the chinqua pins were, when they were brought to me, uh, I, I found them very interesting because it's right up my alley. And I want to talk a little bit about native foods and why we eat what we eat. And when my ancestry, as I look around, I think most of the people here are European ancestry is European descent. When we came here in the early days, I mean, a lot of it was the Puritans, and we looked at the Native Americans, and we said that you're heathens, you're subhuman, and you're not Christian. Therefore, we're not going to eat what you eat because your food has not been blessed by our Savior and our Lord Christ and, and our God. And so we brought everything with us. And so if you look at, if you take out of our basics that we eat, other than corn, potatoes, tomatoes, squash, peppers, those are the big ones. You've got, of course, cocoa and vanilla and coffee. But, I mean, the staples, everything else we eat came from Europe. Almost all of our fruits, all of our leafy greens, uh, there's not much in our diet in the grocery store that was here. So when we're growing the native plants that are here, one thing, there's, there's a cornucopia of foods that are out there that people were eating before we showed up as Europeans. Now, the rest of the world, as we went from the Hunter Gather Society and to the Agrarian Society, we did exactly what we're doing on our farm. We were picking plants for flavor, for nutrition, for um, medicinal, and for preservative qualities. And when you found a one plant and those that they were gathering that was particularly strong in that, when we started planting plants, we planted those strong seeds. And then over years, we developed our modern cultivars. And that is, I think, I'm not an expert on plants <coughs> at all, but it seems to me right up the alley of, of what you're trying to do with the chinkle pins and what I'm trying to do personally with a myriad of plants. One of the things about coming to the Midwest was that um, I felt like that no one had ever done, from a chef's point of view, a serious survey of what was wild and out in the woods and had gone about really developing flavor profiles in the same way I was talking about doing with varietal meats and offal, like taking wild plants that people say, oh, that's bitter, or that is really, really sour, but taking those and putting them in context with other flavors, because there are no bad flavors, they're just bad combinations of flavors i.e. the Coke after a Milky Way. Don't try it. But uh, that is where I am trying to go with what we're doing at the restaurant, and uh, it seems to be ties in with Chinkwood Pins. Um, does anyone have any questions about our little endeavor up in Smithville? <laughs> uh, just uh, from what you heard, AJ talking about uh, the analysis, what's your thoughts on that with that? Um, is this something that you think uh, more people will like rediscover? They're, they used to know it, but uh, with this being brought back, what's your thoughts on that about a food source? I think it's, it's very possible there, there are, you know, just like other wild plants, there are always limitations that have to be thought about. Um, uh, a efficient way to get them out of the shells, and also, I mean, I, believe me, I've, I've cracked, I had uh, in the past couple weeks, some were sent to me, I had probably I don't know, a half gallon of spent shells, and probably half of them I did with my fingers. My fingers have gotten very <laughs> tough in the last couple of weeks. There's, a, I noticed that some of these, there's some kind of little mealy worm uh, in some of them. Uh, you know what, what it is specifically? Chestnut weevil. Okay, is that, yeah. is that the, the, the ones I sent you, I did not de-weevil them. I should have, that's, I just no, never realized. No, 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 no. That's, no, no, no. That's, that's fine. That's part of wild foods. And that's all, you know, we raise everything. We're not certified organic, but, you know, yeah. there's... There, uh, you know, there are bugs out there, and that's uh, mm -hmm. that's just part of it. Um, yes. What characteristics uh, of the chinka pin capture your imagination, and how, what, how, how do you think you'll be using them? It, it doesn't taste like any other nut I've had. Um, we toasted them, and I brought samples. By the way, my pastry chef and I worked on something 
Uh, we made uh, little mini butterfingers, but the crispy interior, instead of being peanut, is made with chinkapin. And I've got a little wild pawpaw sauce that I'm going to put a few drops on top, and we're going to pass one out to everybody. And so you'll get an idea of what, other than the raw chinkapin, what it can be in, say, not even just at someone at home, but this is getting close to, say, a manufactured packaged product. And uh, I, th I think it's possibilities. Again, if we can get yield, if you can get ease of shelling, because after that, I mean, you know, the, the yield within the shell, the amount of, of shell to nut uh, is very low. Nut to shell is very, very high. And, um, and the flavor is amazing. I mean, there's, and they do, there's things, you know, like when I was going through them, and, and that's one thing about everyone only having one of these, you may have gotten one that's not as good as another, because there is a wide ver variable in quality of flavor. Some of them can run very sweet. I had one earlier tonight that was actually pretty saline. It was a little salty and, and not as sweet. But it's, it's pleasant. When you put them all together, you get one thing. But if you're going to sell them and you're going to, you know, you need consistency. And that's, again, what goes into what we're doing on our farm, what will happen eventually as you be able to reintroduce them. And then if people start to try to start propagating, they're going to take seeds from superior genetic stock and, and try to breed those and, and bring those into our cultivars. And that, that's the way I'd see it happening. Yes? Oh, what is the name of your restaurant? I didn't hear. It's Justice Drugstore. The Justice is J-U-S-T-U-S. -U -S. Uh, the full name is Justice Drugstore, a restaurant. Um, a little about the restaurant, uh, just to uh, qualify myself. Um, we've been written about in every major food magazine, about a dozen issues of Food and Wine magazine, uh, half a dozen issues of Bon Appetit. Uh, Travel and Leisure was very disrespectful to the rest of the state, said we were the reason to visit Missouri. And, uh, 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 New York Times has reviewed us, Wall Street Journal, Chicago Tribune, San Francisco Chronicle, the LA Times. Um, we've been written about in every major food publication in the country. Oh, cool. Okay. And it's in Kansas City? No, it's in a small town of Smithville, north of Kansas City. And, and that's, it's unusual. It's a town of about 8,000 people. And if you look up our menu online, you'll see that I, mean, I do, again, I, I don't apologize for it. I have people come in. I'm going to give a quick, uh, <laughs> we have an open kitchen. And I was cooking one night, and I see this woman and a man walk by the, the, uh, the front of the restaurant. And they were probably in their 70s. And the man's walking about 10 feet in front of the woman. And so the woman's walking by, and she looks and stops and goes like this. And then here's the window. The next thing I see, she's like this with him. <laughs> and then they, they come into the restaurant, and as soon as they sat down, I could see his body language, and he was not, he looked at the menu, and he said, he wanted the hell out of it. And, uh, and so my wife, who's a server, went up and talked to them, and he was very, um, <clears throat> at, he was agitated. And, uh, and we find this not all the time, but it happens because we're in a small town. People come in and they're expecting, oh, it's a drugstore, it's going to be a little tiny. And then they, they get in, and, and our space is a very modern space. It's not the building, although the property has been in our family for 175 years, the building is mid 1950s, and we kind of ran with that with the interior. And so it's, a, it's an extremely modern space. And so she kind of explained what we were about and said that, you know, that my husband is, this is really is about country food. and. So he went ahead and he ordered, and, and I was afraid. I go out and talk to tables, and I was afraid to go to this table. <laughs> and uh, I went out to the table, and I said, how was everything? And he said, i got to tell you something right now. I did not want to come in here. My wife dragged me in here. She had heard about your restaurant. We were just looking around shops downtown, and she had forgotten about you and saw you and dragged me in here. And I'm going to tell you right now, that was quite simply the best meal I have ever had in my life. <laughs> and, and that's the kind of thing I love. When someone, because... If you're coming to our restaurant and what I'm doing, these are my compositions. These are, it's pretentious, but these are my, this is my art. And, and I, I spent two to three months on an entree. I've had dishes. I did um, a brisket dish that was elements of root beer. And we uh, um, went out in the woods and gathered uh, things like sass sassafras leaves and sycamore bark and spice bush. And, um, and we developed our own root beer. And... And I was really proud of it. I've always loved root beer. My wife and I, we were poor in San Francisco, and I'd buy these really high-end root beers from these uh, uh, brewers in the, in the Pacific Northwest. And she'd say, really, do you need to spend $2 on a bottle of root beer? You know how poor we are? And so she went up to our corner store. Our corner store in San Francisco has an amazing breadth of diversity of product. And she bought 13 root beers and set them down and poured them each in a glass and then didn't tell me which glass was which and I pulled 13 out of 13. 
And so <laughs> when we did this dish, was, this was written about in the New York Times, I did this dish that was a brisket. And what had happened, we had, we had uh, made the root beer. And after I made the root beer, we did kind of a, a little a dessert. It was like a root beer.